Now that we've shared what we're going to do, time to share why we're going to do it this way with the tanks in 52SE, starting with what science and experience has told us. First, why did the hobby chase 0.00 or no phosphate or 0.03, which is near zero for so long? And why is that now often considered a flawed approach? Answer is back in the day, we were all fighting algae. It was one of the biggest problems that the average reefer faced. Science told us if we reduce phosphate to 0.03 or below, it inhibit algae growth. And they were right. If you maintain those low levels, a vast majority of algae would near stop growing in the tank. However, this is what I would call the whack-a-mole approach to reefing, where when you hit one thing with a hammer, another pops its head up. What this didn't consider is that zooxanthellae within the coral is an algae. So starving the tank of phosphate to stunt algae growth will starve the zooxanthellae and ultimately stunt the coral growth or in extremes, starve them to sickness or mortality. Now, the problem in reefing is that's not always true, and the answer is always more complex than a yes or no. Some tanks thrive at zero testable phosphate, but how can that be? The answer is organic phosphorus. For instance, on my first tank, I used GFO religiously to keep algae out of the tank, but I also made homemade frozen fish food filled with organic particulates and nutrients. Check out the video called DIY Reef Chili. I did end up with sky-high nitrate levels because I didn't address that. Net result is the tank thrived, and I didn't actually have to test for phosphate because when the GFO was exhausted, the excess nitrate would cause the algae to take off with any material phosphate level. I also periodically lost corals or fish for unknown reasons over time. I would now tell you that I wholeheartedly believe that was the net result of nitrate polluted water and whatever comes with that nitrate that's not phosphate or easy to test for 20 years ago. While I was happy with the GFO based result, it isn't a path that I emulate in a reef tank now. I do believe the constant use of GFO in a fish-only tank where there's no corals is worth considering, but I would still have a nitrate goal. There are more advanced approaches. For instance, the BRS-160. We followed a loose version of Zeovit, which has zero or near zero phosphate for much of the tank's existence. The nature of Zeovit is to run near zero inorganic phosphate and nitrate to prevent algae growth and reduce the population of brown zooxanthellae in the coral so the coral's color and fluorescent pigments pop. They do that by feeding amino acids and other organic nutrients like bacterial mulm on the zeolite media to the corals to provide for their nutritional needs and make them less reliant on that zooxanthellae, which can reduce the desirable coloration. This worked on the 160 in Jason's tank, which was religiously run zeovit tank, but also requires you to feed these nutrient sources constantly and then scale them with growth. At times when we got lazy with the 160, the coral showed it within weeks. I would run the Zeovit approach again, and it even fits my tinkering or perfecting part of the hobby that I enjoy. But I would never run seven tanks this way because it's too much effort. And I think the value of the reefing community is to teach less cutting edge, easier to replicate methods. Those methods based on personal successes, failures, and experience, but also consider science and biology. My first lesson on phosphate came from Randy Holmes Farley's article, Phosphate and the Reef Aquarium. The article suggests that it's likely that phosphate inhibits the production of calcium carbonate skeletal structure and shares studies showing that levels as low as 0.19 parts per million for as little as three hours a day can slow skeletal growth by as much as 43% with Piscillopora and similar results with Acropora. What was most compelling for me is this study was done in the ocean on a healthy reef that also has natural sources of organic phosphate, which many lab experiments don't address. I found that Randy Holmes Farley's general counsel in this article to be compelling, and it served as a foundational element for much of the hobby's views on phosphate in their reef tanks. There are many other articles like it, most of them suggesting below 0.1 parts per million phosphate for sensitive species of coral like Acros. However, there are other studies that present a different result that shows how complicated all of this conversation can be. For example, effects of phosphate on growth and skeletal density, a controlled experimental approach published in the Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. In this study, they exposed Acropora to phosphate levels of 0.09, 0.2, and 0.5 parts per million for four months. Growth rates were the highest at the phosphate concentration of 0.5 parts per million, which is higher than we're told to maintain in our tanks. The highest levels of phosphates also produced no visible signs of stress on the corals. However, it did affect what you can't see with the naked eye. The skeleton was significantly more brittle, had a much lower density, which scaled up with the concentrations of phosphate. More or less, it would seem that the increased phosphate increased the zooxanthellae populations and the amount of energy they produced, which overcame the phosphate effects on the skeleton. However, contrary to what you might think, they finished by saying coral growth alone is a poor indicator of reef health. 
high growth rates that produce poor skeletal structure is not what I'd consider ideal health either. Sacrifices are being made. What's interesting about this study is it's done in an artificial environment, which in some ways is more similar to our tanks than studies performed on a natural reef. However, in other ways, it introduces a myriad of variables and interferences that may be different than our tanks. Number of fish, amount of food, what type and frequency of organic coral foods, flow, and other influences that what we as Aquarius deal with and likely why so many of our results are so different from each other's. Also compelling is a study called Context Dependent Effects on Nutrient Loading on the Coral Algal Mutualism. In this study, they addressed the fact that all these individual studies suggest complex, even contradictory relationships amongst nutrient availability, coral physiology, and coral growth. So they attempted to look at dozens of popular studies on elevated nitrate and phosphate to find the consistencies between them all. More or less, this is what they found. Overall, they found that over a wide range of concentrations, nitrogen reduced coral calcification by 11% on average, but enhanced metrics of coral photobiology, such as the photosynthetic rate. In contrast, phosphorus enrichments increased the average calcification rate by 9%, likely through direct impacts on the calcification process, but minimally impacted coral photobiology. This is not what we'd expect to see from elevated phosphorus, but I believe the most important thing that they found, and maybe the most important lesson of this entire video, is naturally occurring enrichment from fish excretion increased coral growth, while human-mediated enrichment tended to decrease coral growth. Essentially, dosing nitrate and phosphate into the system or pollution from runoff in the wild did have negative effects on corals, but the nutrients from fish poop and other biological waste increased growth. There's nuance here that goes beyond just nitrate and phosphate levels, and it would seem that feeding your fish generously might be the best path. It matches my experience with the DIY reef chili on my first tank. It may even explain the organic approaches from methods like Zeovit. Sadly, one of the things that these studies miss is it doesn't look at does it produce a colorful display aquarium. In fact, they imply that it'll have a negative impact on that because most of the studies state that elevated inorganic nitrate and phosphate increases the zooxanthellae population density, which we as aquarists know causes the corals to appear brown as a zooxanthellae overpowers the coral's natural color and fluorescent pigments. It's also worth noting that while many of these studies are elevated nitrate and phosphate by science standard or standards of levels found in most healthy reefs, most of these studies are testing levels that are still much lower than what most reefers would call a dirty tank. 